The town of Domfield lies within Derbyshire, close to the boundary with Sheffield. The area is traditionally supposed to have been settled in Anglo-Saxon times, the name eventually being given to it, meaning open land where there are bees. It is a small, neat market town, pleasantly situated in a valley, surrounded except on the western side with verdant eminences crowned with trees of various hues and beautifully interlaid with golden plats of shining cornland. The finest spring water in the kingdom issues abundantly from the rocks and winds in serpentine directions almost through every part. Here too is plenty of coal at a very reasonable rate. Every necessary article of life is attainable on moderate terms. House rent is low, and land in general proportionably so. This place has long been celebrated for an uncommon salubrity of air, which at present encourages the residence of several respectable families, and undoubtedly has given rise to the numerous pretty buildings that salute the eye in almost every quarter. This is how Dronfield is described in the Universal British Directory of 1792. Dronfield's 19th century history really began when the old 1756 turnpike route was realigned in 1795 to run through the River Valley as the road from Dronfield to Meadowhead and Sheffield does today. This made communication much easier at a time when industry was beginning to develop. There was a toll house here at the Coach and Horses at a point where two of these turnpike roads met. Extensive development took place in Dronfield after World War II. Toward the northeast along Green Lane, the former highway and original turnpike, taking in the ancient hamlet of Cole Aston. Later development to the west along the Gosforth Valley swallowed up another of Dronfield's secondary settlements, Dronfield Woodhouse. The buildings here have mostly survived, if in an altered form. But let us now go back to the beginning. The first settlement is traditionally supposed to have been begun near the site of this building on Church Street. The importance of this building is derived not just from its crock construction, which is an early form of timber framing, using oak timbers which stretch from ground level right to the ridge of the roof, but also from its position above what must then have been the good water supply of the Lee Brook. The preaching cross here predates the church. The earliest date we have for a building on the nearby site is 1135, when Oscott was rector. The cross stands on a rather broken, stepped octagonal base, and the stump of the shaft bears a simple carved triangular design. The church building as we now see it replaced an earlier one. An unusual feature of the building is the chancel, the proportions of which dominate those of the nave. The result, it is thought, of the involvement of Beechy Abbey in the parish church from the early 15th century onwards. The parish church of Dromfield, dedicated to St. John the Baptist, was originally founded in the year 1135 and occupied a space roughly equivalent to the area between the colonnade of the existing nave with a roof line to the height that can be seen on the chancel wall. In 1260, we, knew, we know that Henry de Brailsford held the advowson or right of presenting the next rector to the living at the parish church of Dromfield. And it's at this time that the existing chancel 
was commenced in its present form. The old one was demolished and the new one was built to its present width, but only to about two thirds of its existing length, roughly the equivalent down to the chancel steps. A new roof was raised on the chancel walls, probably to the height of the existing chancel arch. In 1390, Richard III granted the license for the appropriation of the great tithes from the parish church at Dromfield. And in 1403, the canons of Beechef Abbey, to whom the church had been bequeathed by Henry de Brailsford, was, was taken over and they, for the next 135 years, acted as rector to the parish church. They commenced the final major building operation of the church by adding the north aisle, at the same time introducing the colonnade between the south aisle and the nave and the north aisle and the nave. And because now there was no direct light into the middle part of the nave, the clerestory roof was raised and the clerestory windows were added. In 1603, two laws were passed which required churches to provide a pulpit for the preaching of sermons and a chest for the keeping of church records. Our existing pulpit of black oak dates from that time and has carvings of the vine of life. The chest at the back of church signifies the extent of the geographical parish of Dromfield originally. On it are carved five initials V for the Vicar of Dromfield, DC, Dromfield Church Warden, A, Aston Church Warden, Holmesfield, and T, Totley Church Wardens. The alabaster tomb in the South Isle is completely devoid of any means of identification. It's thought, or it's been ascribed, to Robert Barley of Dromfield Woodhouse Hall. It's regrettable that the amount of medieval stained glass that we have in the parish church today is considerably less than has been recorded in the past. In 1710, Bassano, and in 1760, Reynolds, in 1808, Lissons, each recorded much, much more medieval stained glass than we see today. Opposite the church is the Green Dragon, which only became an inn following the dissolution of the monasteries in 1545. The original medieval hall on this site comprised parts of what is now the Chantry Hotel and the Green Dragon and was inhabited by the Chantry priests who served the parish church. Not far away off Church Street is another of Dronfield's significant buildings. It was here in 1579 that the Free Grammar School of Henry Fanshawe was founded under the terms of his will. Fanshawe, a local boy, had gone to London seeking fame and fortune and rose to become Queen Elizabeth's remembrancer of the Exchequer. The school was set up under the terms of the will for the bringing up of poor children and such others as shall come thither in virtue and in learning. And what was called a convenient schoolhouse was built to accommodate them, together with sufficient funds to pay for the wages of a discreet, learned, honest schoolmaster and usher. The old grammar schoolhouse has been much altered, perhaps after the removal of the school to Chesterfield Road in 1867, but the stonework round the windows still shows evidence of the activities of former pupils. Schoolboys don't change much over the years. 20th century pupils may not be pirates, like one who carved his name as a reminder of his school days in Dronfield. In 1731, the inhabitants of Dronfield subscribed to build a house for the second master or the usher of the old free grammar school. Instead of building it of stone, which would have been normal in the area, they chose instead to build it of fashionable brick, hence the name Red House. Its neighbour, the old vicarage, which is now the church hall and a bookshop, was built about the same time. And these two buildings were then, and still are, the only two buildings built of brick in the whole of the town centre. 
Joseph Taylor, who was usher of the grammar school from 1786 to 1814, at a time when the grammar school itself was in difficulties, decided to add to his income by opening up his own private school. In 1804, he built what we now call the Grange and went into partnership with a man called William Butterman. Together, they ran what they called the Classical Mathematical and Commercial Academy at Dronfield. He made sure that we shouldn't forget it by having his name and the date inscribed in Latin around a window on the street frontage. Dronfield High Street has many buildings within it from many different periods, which accounts for the obvious difference in architectural styles. The existence of the barn, which won a European Architectural Heritage Award, is an indication that there were once working farms and farm buildings in the centre of the town. But it has another significance, taking us back to 15th century Dronfield. The site where the barn stands was an important vantage point, overlooking the river valley and the slopes beyond, a good place to watch for the approach of strangers. Not only that, the interior timber construction of the barn is of such quality that it seems to suggest that it was first built as a house in the medieval period. It must then have been both prominent and important in terms of the town's layout. Across the road from the barn are two of the oldest buildings in High Street. The little building which is gable end onto the street probably dates from around 1600 and could perhaps once have been part of a group of similar age or one wing of a larger house. Its original plan can still be seen from external features such as the blocked up central doorway. And although there have been many internal alterations, the original room divisions and ceiling heights can still be detected. The terrace of three townhouses immediately adjacent to the little building replaced a group close to the Tithe Barn in the late 18th century, at a time when Dronfield was becoming a much sought after place to live, away from the smoky atmosphere of Sheffield. The Blue Stoops dates from the late 16th century. Although it has been rebuilt at some unknown date, the style matches the date stone on the street front. But the masonry does not. In both bars downstairs, there are splendid stone fireplaces and a date stone matching that on the street front. Two other buildings add to the high street's elegance and diversity. The cottage, hidden behind trees and a high wall, is really an L-shaped 17th century house which has been given a Victorian front. Its near neighbour, the hall, remains today much as it was when first built in the last decade of the 17th century or the early years of the 18th. It has a balanced, symmetrical design, an imposing parapet and an elegant doorway. Many of the larger houses in the whole Dronfield area were built by successful lead merchants. Two of the earliest ones are down in the valley on the main road through Dronfield. Chiverton is the third house known to have been on this site. It was originally part of Beachy Fabuland and references to it go back to the early 1500s. There is a plan of 1692 which shows the house and the land surrounding it as it was at that time when it was lived in by Richard Hall of Barlow Lees. He lived at Chiverton until his death in 1709 and after that it was bought by Robert Atrop Brown who came from Middlesex. He came to Chiverton in 1712 and the tower-like structures at each end of the house are attributed to his period of residence. Apart from that, the house has remained virtually unaltered to this day. Rose Hill has a 1612 date stone on what is now an internal wall of the house and a 1717 date stone 
over this elegant doorway on the roadside frontage, indicating possibly a change of ownership at that time or an alteration to the house. The families who lived here associated with lead mining are the Moorwoods and the Greenwoods. The Moorwood family is also connected with Hallows Hall, now the clubhouse of Hallows Golf Club. Gilbert Moorwood's brother Andrew, also a prosperous lead merchant, built Hallows in 1657. The county library at the top of High Street was built between 1700 and 1710 by the then Lord of the Manor, Ralph Burton. The Burtons were a prosperous Holmesfield family who also had interests in lead mining. Ralph Burton was killed by a fall from his horse in August 1714 on the moors not far from Burbage Brook. And since he had no heirs, the manor of Dronfield was shared between his sisters. In 1756, when the last of those heiresses died, the manor with its manor house was bought by John Rotherham V. He was a descendant of the first John Rotherham, who had established the family's fortunes with his interests in lead mining and in millstone making. In 1797, when the last of those Rotherhams died, the manor and its manor house came to Joseph Cecil of Little Sheffield. And it's from that time that the Rotherham Cecil family have been lords of the manor of Dronfield, and they remain so to this day. Their manor house was altered some time in the late 19th century by the insertion of sash windows on the front of the building. Dr. Howard Fletcher, one of the town's GPs, bought it in 1939 and gave it to the town for use as urban district council officers. In 1967, the former manor house was gutted, the chimneys were removed, and it became the library building that we know today. This staircase is one of the few early internal features still remaining. One of the abiding puzzles about this part of High Street is the history of Rookery Cottage. In 1970, the town planners wanted to pull it down, but the newly formed Old Dronfield Society, together with other townsfolk, protested and the house was saved. It was reduced in size, restored, and the entrance to it improved. It has obvious 17th century features, having been built in the 17th century, and it has enjoyed different names throughout its long history. It has been called the Old Manor House, the Armory, and now it is Rookery Cottage. But we still do not know whether in fact it was Dronfield's Manor House before Ralph Burton built his impressive house at the top of High Street. Dronfield's High Street isn't just noted for its varied architecture. Signs of the town's industrial development in the 19th century can be found here too. The most notable indication of which is this sturdy gritstone monument at the entrance to what is now the Civic Centre. It replaced the old Market Cross when it was erected in 1854 by public subscription, commemorating the life of Sir Robert Peel and his successful repeal of the hated Corn Laws in 1846. Members of developing industrial communities in the 19th century, of which Dronfield was one, benefited considerably from their release from what was called the bread tax. Hence this Corn Law monument, an unusual feature of any town's high street. The gaps in the high street have their own story to tell. The census years between 1851 and 1881 show a rapidly increasing population, many of whom came to the town to work in the fast developing coal industry, as well as in the more traditional metalworking industries, particularly after 1870 when Wilson Camel set up their rail making plant on Cali White Lane. The first edition of the Ordnance Survey map in 1876 shows us High Street as it was then, with yards running off it full of small houses and workshops. Posts Yard, Stoops Yard and Ward's Yard, where the Blue Stoops car park is now, were all on one side of the street. On the other side, Chapel Yard and Outram's Yard 
with the Ivy Public House filling this gap. Then there was Goodwin's Yard at the top of Farwater Lane and Machin's Yard at the top of Soper Lane, all of them thronged with people. Another public house, the Blue Bell, stood at the corner of Church Street and High Street. On the opposite side of that same corner in the 1870s, the old buildings were pulled down and tailors' buildings and the town hall erected with shops below and accommodation above, where businesses now flourish. Rooms were available for meetings, dances and social events, as well as a mechanics institute for the young men of the town, which by then was growing in importance and self-esteem. Filling the gaps in a conservation area like Dronfields is not easy. Any new design has to harmonise with existing buildings. The preferred building material is stone, and care has to be taken with the framing of doors and windows. Machen's Court here is a very good example of how conservation area building should be done. But the whole of that is very costly, and it can deter would-be developers. The growth in the population in the 19th century brought with it a demand for new places of worship for the many denom denominations increasingly represented in the town. The parish church had served the spiritual needs of Dronfield people for centuries, but not everyone felt able to subscribe in conscience to the form of worship which it stood for. In 1727, the Quakers' Meeting House was licensed in Chapel Yard. They were the first dissenting sect that we know about and had been persecuted in the latter part of the 17th century. The Quakers were not the only dissenting group. Several individuals were licensed in 1672 to hold meetings in their houses, one being Francis Stevenson's on Coit Green. Meanwhile, Dronfield's independent church had several meeting places in the 18th century, including one at the White Swan. Eventually, in 1861, yet another chapel was built to hold the, by then, thriving Congregational Church. It is this building which survives today, still used as a place of worship by the Oaks Christian Fellowship. During its time as a congregational church, this building and those worshipping in it played a significant part in a dramatic episode in Dronfield's history, when the steel rail-making plant of Wilson Camels on Callihwite Lane finally closed after ten years of business in the town on what has always been called Black Friday, the 2nd of April, 1883. The majority of the congregation worked at the plant and when Wilson Camels moved to Workington in Cumbria, the congregation went with them. The minister, the Reverend Charles Burroughs, known as the Steelworks Parson, went too. And the congregational church on the corner of Lee Road entered another phase in its long history. Part of that story in the mid-19th century concerns another of the town's existing places of worship. The Baptist Church at the corner of Studley Lane and Gosforth Lane was opened in 1871, but like the Methodists and the Congregationalist, this building was not the first one that the Baptists had. They began life in 1846 in a small building on the river bank near to the site of the present station, after the Reverend David Clark had forsaken his ministry in Dronfield's Independent Church. In the late 1860s, during the laying of the railway track through the valley, this first chapel building had to be demolished, and the, and the congregation moved to its new home here on the corner of Studley Lane, where it still worships today. The Methodist Free Church was built here at the top of High Street in 1863, on the site of Wild Goose's butcher stall opposite the Old Market Cross and the town's water pump. It survived as a place of worship until 1992 when it closed and the trustees offered it to Churches Together in Dronfield. It opened again as the Peel Centre in the following year, its various rooms being named after prominent past Dronfeldians and providing facilities for community use 
while still retaining as far as possible some of the building's original features. With the coming of the railway in 1870 and the rapid industrial development that followed, especially with the opening of the camel works on the eastern side of the town, Dromfield had scarcely developed beyond the original settlement on the rising ground beyond the church and in the valley bottom below. The rocky escarpment on the eastern side of the Drone Valley meant there was little growth on that side. But in the 1870s, the town spread up Snape Hill and Green Lane with new terraced housing on and around Hartington Road and Cecil Road. Many shops opened to serve the rising population, both in the town centre and in the areas of new housing. One of the most important being that of the Cooperative Society on the corner of Snape Hill Lane. Similarly, on the other side of the valley, Terraces on Hallows Lane, Coit Green, Scarsdale Road and Chesterfield Road housed the influx of workers to the new steelworks. Unfortunately for Dromfield, this newfound prosperity was short-lived. With the depression in the coal industry and the movement of the Wilson Camel workforce to Workington, many houses were left empty and could be bought for a song. Some houses remained empty for many years. Others have since been pulled down. This area here is the site of bike-to-bike -bike houses built by Wilson Camel for some of its workforce. It was known locally as Camel's Row. This part of Dromfield is known locally as Dromfield Bottom. Today, the Drone Valley is an important routeway for both road and railway. But in the past, it has been associated with a variety of industries at different stages in the town's history. Dromfield had two corn mills in the valley. One of them was on this site, and it is of medieval origin, if not earlier. Today, the site has been tidied up, and few recognizable traces of it now remain. Water power was important before the age of steam, and at one time, there were six mill dams between the station at Tromfield and the old mill house down at Unston. There was a mill dam on this site, and there was a fulling mill down at Fallswood, which is opposite the Mason's Arms. Dromfield's second corn mill was on the station site. Also on this site was a large mill dam. The dam wall was just beyond the station building on the left. There was a large water wheel which drove a tilt hammer. There was a forge. It was later owned by the Lucas family. Around the dam side, there are also other small workshops and a wood yard. And behind were other small workshops which dealt with grinding, making edge tools. And beyond, near the stream, were industries which required water, for example, tanning and dyeing and soap making. The coming of the Lucas brothers to Dromfield at the beginning of the 19th century gave a great impetus to industrial development in the town. Samuel Lucas bought this site upstream from the mill dam and where the dye works used to be in order to develop his patent for the manufacture of malleable iron. However, it was Edward Lucas who lived at Vale House on the slopes facing the works, who ran a very successful business here. Among other things, the foundry made wheels and axles for railway engines and spindles and flyers 
for the textile industries in England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. The arch is all that is left of what was known locally as the bottom yard. Successive generations of the Lucas family were also involved in coal mining. Coke ovens associated with one of their mines is shown on a map of 1846 in fields off Snape Hill. With the building of the railway in the late 1860s, the mill dam on this site had to be filled in and small workshops at the junction of the former Lee Road and Soper Lane, together with water-powered grinding workshops, had either to move elsewhere or close altogether. Two of these so affected were Harrison's and Locox. The old forge on this site was also closed. Lucas's continued with their original foundry, but also opened a new one opposite the Greyhound Inn, where spades and shovels were made. After the coming of the railway, many things changed in the valley. The course of the river was affected, and crossing places over it eliminated. Lee Road, and Soper Lane crossed the railway by two separate bridges, and this caused a good deal of controversy in the town. On the old Bill Dam site, the railway station was built. Along the Drone Valley, collieries were enlarged or new ones opened up. Among these was the Dromfield Silston Colliery on Callywhite Lane and the Rhodes Colliery at Summerley. They both took advantage of the National Railway Network. This is the site of one of the Oxclose Collieries at Gorsey Brig. Others were located on Gosforth, on Gomersal Lane, Stubley, Fallswood, and at Anston. Most of the collieries in Dromfield had coke ovens because they worked the Silston seam, which produced a good coke, much in demand in the Sheffield steel industry. The Dromfield coal industry has now disappeared and few traces remain. Other industries grew in the 1830s, developed in the 19th century, only to close in the 20th century. The Damstead works are an example of this. Here on the Damstead site, the grinding shops made edge tools. George Ward had a works here making spindles and flyers. This is the base of a steam-driven beam engine which was used for driving the machinery, making the spindles and flyers, and for grinding. Charles Locock had a site at the old mill dam, and in 1870 he had to move to Princess Street set up a new works making reaping hooks and scythes which were sent all over the world. Silcox beach works which made edge stools were on Sheffield Road near the bottom of Snape Hill. Allen and Elshaws and William Lees were on Callywhite Lane which became one of Dromfield's industrial areas. Wilson Camel built their new steel works on Callywhite Lane and produced in their rolling mills steel rails for railways which were sent all over the world. 
It was the railway which came to Dromfield in 1870, which brought the Wilson Camel Works to Dromfield in 1873. This was one of the routeways which led towards the works. The work stayed for 10 years, and it was a sad day for Dromfield in 1883 when the whole works was transferred to Workington. Dromfield's many inns played their part in the town's history. The Manor Court was held in both the Green Dragon and the Blue Stoops at different times. The Red Lion, a favourite place for the town's hatters in the 1830s and 40s, was located by the medieval bridge over Lee Brook, a suggestion of which still remains in the garden wall of Bale House. The White Swan was the meeting place of the young men of the town. They came here to read the London newspapers, delivered to the Swan by the regular daily coach, and to discuss the political issues of the day. And it is at the Swan that the old turnpike road leaves Dronfield for the south, having played its part in the town's development from a mainly rural community in the late 18th century into a predominantly industrial place in the 19th and early 20th century. Now, the town is bypassed. Its industrial character has given place to residential estates and less intrusive commercial concerns. But the signs of the old drawn field are still there, when you know where to look. Thank you.